and welcome to a new Light Bite series on creative lighting design. This first part, titled Form and Direction, will be presented to you by Mike Simpson, Global Application Lead at Philips Lighting. Hello, I'm Mike Simpson, and today we're going to look at form and direction as a tool in creative lighting design. In this presentation, we'll see how the direction of light can help to create and enhance the form of an object or surface. We do this by making shadows. You might think that shadows should be avoided, but it is the very presence of shadows that gives us the information we need to identify the shape and form of an object. A good friend of mine always said, it's the dark bits that make the light bits work. This philosophy can be applied to many aspects of lighting design. What we see is always relative to the surroundings, so with darkness as our reference, any light bits become immediately obvious. We need shadows to help us understand shape, form and texture. However, shadows shouldn't be accidental. They should be planned by careful selection of the right light source and its positioning. The fundamental lesson about shadows is that they depend upon the direction of view. We can see the shadow from this bird because we're looking at it in a different direction to the direction that the sun is coming. If we were to move round so that we were looking at the, the bird from the same direction as the sun, then we wouldn't see the shadow. The shadow would be masked by the, the bird. So shadows depend upon the direction of view. So if we're lighting a doorway, for example, then our direction of view will be towards the door. It's an entrance that we're going to go through. So the light should come from opposite directions from that in which we're approaching the doorway. If we're thinking about a building, which are the directions from which it will be seen most, which are its principal direction of views? Maybe it would have two direction of views, or maybe it might be a tower that can be seen from many different angles in which case we have to consider how we can create shadows from all these different angles. We also have to think about the, the scale. Are we going to be close to what we're lighting? So uh, the shadows and the texture that we create in a surface will be visible. Or is it something that we're going to be looking at from far away where some of these subtleties, the small shadows that help give us a clue about the texture of the surface just aren't going to be visible. So to investigate shadows, we can take this head and look at what happens when we shine light at it in different directions. So to begin with, the light is coming from the same direction in which we're looking at. In this case, on the head itself, we don't see any shadows. The lighting is flat. If we move our light source round a little bit, then we begin to see shadows appearing and gradually one side of the face begins to appear in shadow. If we carry on and we move our light source even further round, so it's now directly coming from one side, then the left hand of the face has fallen completely into shadow. And here the shadow is probably so deep that it's giving us misleading information about what it is that we're looking about. And of course, it's not just in this direction. We can also move our light source up in elevation. So it's coming from a higher angle than the direction that uh, we're looking at. This is what's called the, the key light. So in photography and cinematography, uh, the, the, the technique of producing shadows with a strong key light is very well known and understood. So typically your key light wants to be something between 30 and 60 degrees in azimuth, that's in the horizontal direction, and elevated between 30 and 60 degrees above the horizontal. Then we'll get some good shadowing that won't be too deep. However, we might want to add a fill light in from the other side. What the fill light does is to soften the shadow. And typically, a fill light will have a third of the intensity of our key light and comes in from the opposite direction. If we look at our head now, you can see how the shadow has been softened, but it is still there. 
helping to give us clues as to what the structure of the, of the face is. The other thing that we can do with our directional lighting is to come in from the back and this is what we call backlight. So you can see in the image how the object is silhouette, the person is silhouetted there with the light coming from behind so we hardly see any of the facial features. This really helps to create a third dimension in the way that we can model an object and in particular will help to separate them from their background. This is called three-point lighting, key light, fill light and backlight. And shadows of course are things that occur in nature as well. And some of the clues that we get about uh, the time of day uh, and the time of year come from shadows that are created by the sun. It is a strong light source coming from a single direction. So imagine at midday the sun shining down on a tiled roof produces very little shadowing. So we look at that roof and immediately we have an impression as to what the, what the time of day is. As the sun begins to move through the sky uh, during the course of the afternoon and it becomes lower in the sky, so the shadows become longer until we get to the point when the sun is almost on the horizon and we have really long shadows. So again, it's making sure that uh, we're looking at this from a different direction from the, the view that the, the, from the direction that the sun is shining. If we were looking at the same direction as the sun, then we wouldn't see these, these shadows at all. So shadows gives us lots of clues as to what it is that, uh, that we're looking at. And we apply these techniques in our lighting designs and our lighting uh, calculations. On this statue, we've used a key light. We can see as we're looking at the shadow at the statue that the key light is coming from the left hand side and we're, we're looking from the right hand side. So we have strong lighting on one side of the face and a very strong shadow on the opposite side. This we might want to use a softer light uh, to fill in the, the shadow but not completely uh, destroy it giving the effect of volume and a three-dimensional effect for the statue itself. I think if you ever have uh, the situation where you're trying to light anything like this, uh, actually trying to predict what you're going to get by calculation is very difficult and always the best solution is to go with the uh, statue and a light source, hold it in your hand and move it around and begin to see where the shadows are falling to give you an idea as to where it should best be placed given our direction of view. So always come back to that, always think about our uh, principal direction of view. If we look at the facade of this building, you can see how on the left hand side we have some very strong modelling on the pilasters. The direction of view compared to the light source is, is quite uh, uh, obtuse, it's quite a big angle there that uh, is creating those shadows. If we look on the other side, however, where the direction between the light source and the view is much smaller, then our modelling is, is much weaker. And if we look on the centre of the facade there, you can see how with the light source coming from the same direction as that in which we're viewing it from, we have no modelling at all. So clearly, what we would ideally like is to have consistent modelling across the whole of that facade. And that we can achieve by having light coming up from underneath. So now it doesn't matter where we're standing, we always have a similar angle between the light source and our direction of view. This light is now grazing up the front of the building, it's very close to the building, so it's almost impossible that we would ever be looking at the building from the same direction as the light source. So we have a nice consistent modelling and creation of shadows right across the, the whole facade. So direct lighting, no shadows. On this castle on the top of the mound you can see how shadows are used to give us some clues about the walkway that is going up there, the light and shade and the texture of the uh, the stonework itself. 
and on this tower, by grazing light up it, we're looking at this at a fairly close range, with light grazing up from the bottom, then the texture of the stonework is completely revealed and really tells us something about the quality and the workmanship that went into that tower. And you see as we get to the top of the tower how the light that's grazing up begins to hit the fenestrations that are going around the, the stonework at the top, almost creating a, a hat and giving us a, 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 a top to the, to the castle itself. Same techniques, of course, applied indoors, where with this very heavily textured wall that's in a, a retail environment, uh, the shadows are telling us all the information that we need to say this is this is really textured. A lot of work and effort went into creating that wall. And even if we have the scalloped lights from downlighters as against a linear graze effect, you see how the regular pattern and the light falling down the wall very soon turns it into a complete uniform illuminated uh, surface. If we look at this textured stone wall, again we see how shadows are giving us all the information. The deep shadows tell us about the macro structure, the real differences in the way the bricks are being formed, and the smaller shadows are telling us about the micro structure uh, that, that gives us some impression as to the quality of the stone and the workmanship that has created that uh, particular wall. Now you see that wall by daylight where you've got a lot of diffuse light coming in, a lot of those shadows won't be there and the effect will be completely different. What really makes that wall interesting and exciting is the way that we can graze the light down it and make it uh, stand out. The same with this brick wall. The fact that we can see the individual bricks and if you look you'll see how some of the bricks seem to be set just slightly forward tells us all about the fact that this is this is man-made, uh, uh, humans have used their skill to create that wall to place each brick individually and uh, the shadows divide the bricks up into uh, individual ones. So the grazing light is giving us lots of information, it's not flattening all those effects. Although we have to be careful here using down lights creating a rather uneven washed light, in fact the uh, the same wall uh, looks completely different and I think if you look at that you're going to be looking more at the patches of light that are on the wall than the quality of the wall itself.